What are scientists scared of? Well, lots of things, really. Nuclear war is fairly close to the top of the list, as is climate change, the chances of a meteor strike, and the day the sun expands. More immediately, though, they're often a little scared of the bizarre things that are brought to them by archaeologists in search of assistance. And you're going to see some of them in this video. Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, was Irish. The famous vampire he wrote of lived hundreds of miles away in Transylvania, Romania. But might he have been inspired by a figure he was aware of from closer to home? Between the towns of Dungiven and Garvach in North Derry, Ireland, is a district called Glenullen, which contains an area known locally as either the Giant's Grave or Liacht Abaraktak, which translates as Arbatak's Sepulchre. There's no doubt that this is a real tomb. But a tomb for whom? Local legends say that Arbatak was a chieftain, one of many who ruled tiny fractured petty kingdoms in the area. He's also said to have been deformed in some manner, which was the price he paid for his magical powers. Not only was Abartak a powerful wizard, but he was supremely evil. He was eventually killed by Cathan, the king of another local tribe, only to rise from the dead the following day and demand a bowl of blood drawn from the veins of his subjects as nourishment. Cathan struck him down and killed him again. But the following day, Abartak the Undead arose once more. Local superstitions about the sepulchre mean that it's still not been properly investigated by archaeologists to this day. It's far beyond us to say whether or not ghosts are real. If you want to believe in the supernatural, that's up to you. We do know of an abandoned location where ghosts are supposed to come out and play after dark, though, and it's India's Bangar Fort. There are so many stories and superstitions about ghostly activity at this fort that entry is now prohibited after the sun goes down. The fort was built during the 17th century and used to host a whole town's worth of people, but the occupants became so afraid of the alleged ghosts that they abandoned it and built a new town a short distance away from it. The stories about the haunting are colorful. One of them speaks of a wizard who cursed the fort with his final breath after he was fatally wounded by a woman he'd attempted to heal. The gates, temples, and palaces of the old fort stand silently, and tourists still visit during daylight hours, but you're unlikely to catch anyone from the surrounding area in there. The locals think the visitors who visit the site are foolish. Don't let that put you off if you think you're brave enough to stick it out. Le Musée de Moulage in Paris, France might be the creepiest museum in the world. It's an utterly horrifying collection of dermatological models, many of which resemble hacked-off body parts or complete corpses. The museum has been open since 1867. But back then, all it contained were paintings, drawings, and photographs of skin diseases. Things changed when the museum hired a wax fruit modeler, who history records only by the single name of Beretta. Over the next 40 years, Beretta made more than 3,500 wax models of diseased skin and diseased people. Those who love the museum say it's the greatest and most unique intersection of art and science in the world. Those who hate it say it's more like something from a freak show. It's not for us to say which of those categories it belongs to, but we'll say that there are plenty of diseases that you won't even have heard of until you see their effects in the museum, and when you do, you'll wish you never had. The human body is a strange thing, and some of its cruelest tricks are recorded here in wax. Sticking with the topic of 19th century weirdness, let's talk about Victorian mourning dolls. The dolls were part of British folk rituals to mark the death of loved ones and persisted until the early 20th century. The deaths of the time typically took place in the home, after which the remains of the deceased were prepared for burial, often spending time on display in the home. Mortality rates for infants and children were high in Victorian Britain so children were exposed to death at an early age. It wasn't the great taboo that it is today. By the mid-19th century, the commissioning of a special mourning doll to lay at the grave of a deceased child had become an expected part of the grieving and funeral process. Where possible, the hair of the real child would be used in the manufacture of the wax dolls. 
Over time, the dolls became larger and more elaborate. By the late 19th century, the mourning dolls of rich families were often life-sized, realistic effigies of the child they'd lost, dressed in their child's clothes. Prior to the funeral, they'd be kept in a crib. Their clothes would be changed every day, and they'd be treated as a substitute for the real baby. It sounds creepy now, but at the time, it must have been comforting. We're not done with representations of death yet. What you're looking at in these images is a Chamunda sculpture from Jaipur, Odisha, India. The terrifying sculpture looks like something from a horror movie. It has a semi-skeletal body, sunken eyes, a gaping mouth, long nails to scratch you with, and a sunken, emaciated stomach. The veins in its skin seem to be bursting through in an effort to escape. Despite all of this visceral horror, a Chamunda is a sculpture of a goddess. That's right, this monster is a goddess, not a demon. She wears a garland of skulls and ties her matted hair with a snake. In one hand, she holds a bowl full of blood, and in the other, she brandishes a decapitated head. The name Chamunda comes from the belief that she slayed the demons Munda and Chanda, after which she became the goddess of both death and time. Forgive us for being so rude, but to our eyes, it looks like both death and time haven't been kind to her, and that the effort of slaying the demons took a lot out of her. When images of our next discovery first circulated on the internet in 2017, historians quickly wrote it off as a hoax. More recently, though, they've been coming around the idea that it might be real. If we take it at face value, this is a cabinet of poisonous substances hidden away inside a book that was bound in the year 1600. Each of the tiny drawers in the cabinet is labeled, indicating that it once contained deadly nightshade, valerian, thorn apple, castor oil plant, and several other poisons that had the potential to kill you if you consumed them. The one remaining green bottle inside the cabinet is labeled with a message written in Latin that translates as, it is inevitable that all men must one day die. That seems a little on the nose for this to have been an assassin's cabinet, but perhaps the assassin who owned it was something of an eccentric. Those who believe it to be a genuine artifact are keen to point out that it could just as easily be an apothecary. Poison and medicine weren't that far apart at the start of the 17th century, so small doses of poison might have been used as medication. In December 2015, archaeologists dug into the ground beneath the ancient convent of Jacobins in Rene, France, and found this set of five embalmed human hearts buried inside lead urns. Prior to their discovery, they'd been buried for approximately 400 years. Using scanning technology that didn't involve opening the urns, researchers have been able to prove that the hearts inside them still contain their chambers, arteries, and valves. Some of them even still bear signs of the cardiac diseases that probably killed their owners. While the practice of removing a heart and entombing it separately from the rest of the body might sound odd today, it was considered romantic a few centuries ago. The heart would eventually be buried with the widow or widower of the deceased when the time came for them to die. One of the hearts, that of Toussaint Perrin, a knight of Brafelia, was found inside the lead coffin of his wife Louis de Quengo, Lady of Brefilia. She passed away in 1656 and literally took her husband's heart with her to the grave. When you put it like that, it sounds sweet. The Nazca Lines in Peru are arguably the most famous petroglyphs in the world, but we know very little about who created them. One of the few things that we do know, though, is that those very same people also had a ghoulish habit of collecting human heads and keeping them as trophies. It was long suspected that the trophy heads were taken from enemies in battle, but a 2009 study destroyed that assumption. By studying trophy head specimens at the Field Museum in Chicago, USA, scientists were able to prove that the heads belonged to people who lived in the same place and belonged to the same culture as the people who collected them. Rather than battle trophies, the heads may have been kept as part of a practice related to ancestor worship between 1500 and 2000 years ago. 
whatever the reason might have been. It seems that the heads were worn as accessories, perhaps during rituals or ceremonies. The skulls of the heads have been pierced to allow a woven cord to be passed through them for this purpose. The treatment process used by these ancient people did such a good job of preserving the heads that many of them still have all of their hair after all this time. It was said by Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Naturalist and Egyptologist Girolamo Segato's work with mummification and petrification was so advanced that we still have no idea how he achieved his remarkable results today. And the reason we don't know is that he terrified the 19th century society he lived in. Many of his peers feared that he was a witch and destroyed all written records of his work after his death. Segato, a professor, was fascinated by the chemistry of the human anatomy for his whole life and had a particular interest in ancient Egyptian mummies. He traveled to see some when he was 26 years old and developed a new, better method for preserving the human body after he returned. Rather gruesomely, he also made the so-called Segato table out of petrified muscles, bones, and pieces of intestine. It's no wonder that people found the man and his methods a little creepy, but it's surprising that we still can't discover the secrets of those methods 200 years later. What doomed the ancient town of Atlit Yam and condemned it to collapse into the water off the coast of Haifa, Israel? Scientists have been able to tell us that the town has been beneath the waves for around 8,300 years, but they haven't yet been able to say how it got there. However, being underwater has helped to preserve the town and its structures. Because of that, marine archaeologists can still see Atlit Yam's water wells, individual houses, and burial grounds partitioned off from the rest of the town. That's a greater degree of town planning than we expect to find with people who lived 8,300 years ago. We generally think of them as little more than nomadic hunter-gatherers. Based on the evidence of Atlit Yam, we should reassess that perspective. In the middle of the town was a freshwater spring which was surrounded by a stone circle. Examining the bones of the people in the graveyard has led to an even more surprising discovery. At least two of them died from tuberculosis. These are easily the oldest known cases of tuberculosis in the world, and might offer an alternative explanation as to why the town was abandoned to its fate. Although we usually associate Vikings with war and conquest, they were also skilled builders and innovators. One example of their genius in the field of innovation is the existence of the Visby lenses. Although we found plenty of examples of these lenses in Viking graves on Sweden's Gotland Island, nobody can say with any certainty what they were used for. Guesses range from an early attempt at creating a telescope to an efficient way of starting fires. The lenses come from between the 11th and 12th centuries and usually come with a silver mount, although some sets suggest that the mounts aren't quite as old as the lenses. Studies of the lenses have shown that they have low spherical aberration, which is a strong indicator that they were deliberately designed to magnify anything seen through them. Examples of the localized setting in which they are found and the relatively low numbers of examples, it's possible that only one worker was skilled enough to create them, and that no more Visby lenses were made after that person passed away. Nothing this advanced in terms of lens making would appear anywhere else in the world for several centuries. The ancient Sumerians might have been the first advanced civilization in the world, but we understand very little about them. They left many artifacts behind, but those artifacts are often difficult to decipher. This one illustrates our point perfectly. It's 5,500 years old and appears to be covered in mathematical equations. In March 2019, experts came up with a new theory about it. They believe that this seemingly impenetrable clay disk is actually a Sumerian star map and records an asteroid crashing into Earth on June 29, 3123 BCE. The disk-shaped tablet was found in the ancient library of King Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, Iraq, during the 19th century, and eventually found its way to the British Museum. 
A recent translation of the cuneiform inscription on its surface includes the line, a white stone bowl approaching from the sky. The other written elements of the inscription include references to the weather, cloud cover, and the positions of other visible objects in the sky at the time of the incident. Scientists have been able to prove that a large asteroid hit Kofels in Austria on this date, so it must have been truly enormous for this Sumerian astronomer to have been able to see it clearly from such a distance. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.